If you've been with us from the beginning, you know we've explored the heights and the depths of aviation mysteries. But for our seasoned aviators, this is no ordinary episode. It's our 11th, and we got a tale that sends shivers down your spine. As we journey through the clouds this month, we're delving into the shadows of aviation history. Today's story, however, is not for the faint of heart. It's a tale that has left indelible mark on the skies. In this episode, we're going to revisit the ghostly remnants of Eastern Airlines Flight 401, the aircraft that had crashed mysteriously into the Everglades. As we venture into the aftermath, prepare for a descent into the supernatural, where the line between fact and legend blurs like the mist over an eerie swamp. For those who follow us faithfully, you know we don't just recount history. We explore the whispers and the shadows and the things that refuse to be forgotten. So my fellow sky seekers, as we navigate through the haunted skies of episode 11, remember to keep your wits about you because because the clouds may be hiding more than just rain. Welcome to Destination Aviation. Well, aviation enthusiasts, welcome back to the podcast. As you heard from our introduction there, it is, well, we'll see. It could be right at the end of September, but beginning of October, we're thinking a month of spooky aircraft tales as we lead up to Halloween. <laughs> yes, that was uh, me. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. It may drop uh, September 30th, but it's our podcast, so what do we care? It's leading up. It's the time of year where all the streaming services take off all the good Halloween movies that were out over the summer and through the spring and put on Christmas movies or irrelevant movies. That way you can pay for streaming your favorite Fright Fest movies. So we know their game. We know what they're doing. Nice try getting this hooked over June. And now we end up, you know, not really wanting to watch Christmas Vacation, but you can sure as heck but as soon as October 31st is over, Chris's vacation will have to be paid for. That's my rant and rave on streaming services, so I'll stop there because this is not a rant and rave podcast. Um, but no, thank you for coming back. We, uh, we're over at 10 episodes now uh, as we lead into our next stage here of the podcast. So unfortunately, as we spoke about in the last episode, we will see this is being recorded on September 30th if... A government shutdown is looming. It appears that Matt Getz, Speaker McCarthy, uh, nobody is getting along to the point where uh, we may see an actual shutdown. Again, not unheard of, has happened in the past. Speaker McCarthy's in a bad position, obviously, right? He can't, uh, with the concessions that he made just to be Speaker, if he does come to some agreement with Democrats to get a bill through, probably means he loses his gavel. So we are in a interesting time and spot here. There is a House resolution out there, uh, 5711, which would pull the Federal Aviation Administration out completely and then fund that independently. So that way there wouldn't be a hiccup within it. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, most workers that are essential in the system continue working. So like people I know that are traffic controllers, they keep working. They just don't get paid in the moment and they get paid in one lump sum. Obviously, the longer it goes on, as we all know, the more morale starts to go down. You know, they give you a letter to give your mortgage company basically saying, hey, I work for the federal government. They're not paying me. We all know we all have mortgages probably. How well that usually works. Hey, here's a letter that says I can't pay you, but don't worry. I'll get back to you at some point. So obviously morale goes down. The longer these drag out, there's more issues, more, you know, probably coordinated sick outs. It's not allowed, but you see it. To the average user, come October 1st, you'll still be getting on your plane, but you're probably going to have a lot of disgruntled federal employees around you that are not getting paid. So let's hope a miracle gets pulled out tonight, but unfortunately, it's looking less and less likely that Congress is going to be able to find a pathway before the government is shut down. Uh, and really, the hard part for us, like in this industry, is yeah, the end user doesn't see it up front, but the behind the scenes stuff, you know, whether you're doing environmental assessments, uh, if you're working on projects, everything, you know, is clear through the FAA through processes with either, you know, like an obstruction analysis or whatever it might be, all those get stopped. So a lot of those employees that aren't considered essential are at home. Uh, not doing anything. And then eventually when the government decides, yeah, okay, here's the next either continuing resolution or a bill to fund the FAA. In this case, uh, all those employees get paid, but you lose all that productivity. So they're not working on any of those projects. So uh, as you can see, it starts cascading, right? The runway that was being designed and developed maybe at an airport or rehabbed is now on uh 
hiatus because you can't get any of your plants through the FAA. And this also doesn't involve contractors. So for contractors, they're just not getting paid. So now you're starting to slow down projects and stuff. Uh, anything that's currently funded, as long as it's shorts working, but if you are working on a new grant, that's an issue. Or if you're looking to get paid out on a grant, that's an issue. So a lot of the behind the scenes stuff starts to fall apart. And basically, right, however long it is, two, three days, you're taking all that time to uh, slow down productivity uh, and now you have to find time to make that back up. So let's hope it doesn't last too long, uh, but it's not unheard of in history to have a government shutdown. So I did say this would be a spooky tale, which is why we're talking about politics, because no matter which side of the aisle you fall on, there's a lot of spooky stuff that goes on in D.C., not to mention the bureaucracies that surround it. I know we like to hit a little bit of the aviation news in the world. We talked a little bit about the government shutdown. A British Airways pilot was fired after a pre-flight bender. British Airways confirmed it fired a pilot whose layover antics caused it to cancel a flight at a cost of $120,000. Numerous UK publications are reporting the first officer showed up to work in Johannesburg after texting a blow-by-blow description of his cocaine and alcohol-fueled antics to a flight attendant friend. I've been a very naughty boy, he reportedly texted his friend. British Airways uses A380s to fly twice daily service to the South African city. When he showed up there to the flight the next day, the flight attendant turned him in and the flight was canceled. The first officer flew back as a passenger the next day. When he arrived at Heathrow, he was tested for drugs and failed. He was fired on the spot. The airline confirmed it had fired the pilot but did not elaborate. The Civil Aviation Authority said the normal procedure when notified of a failed drug test is to pull the pilot's medical immediately. In most cases, the pilot would have an assessment with a medic- with an expert medical team, and if they wished to return to flying, then a comprehensive rehabilitation program would be put in place. Obviously, flying and alcohol or drugs is a no-no. You're talking to a very safe pilot, so I do not agree with what his antics were there. But I'm just glad that they were able to catch him before he actually got in that aircraft and flew it home. So kudos to the flight attendant for uh, making sure that that did not happen. I have visions in my mind of that movie Flight with Denzel Washington, I believe. I haven't, I've haven't. i seen it like once or maybe half of it once. And I even forget the whole premise there, but I believe he would drink and then the plane did a 360 or whatever happened there. I'm sure it's just mostly Hollywood fiction, but maybe I'll be able to watch it since it's Halloween season. <laughs> I know, back to the rant on the streaming services. And now I'm just going to touch on one last story before we get into our main spooky story, because I found this very interesting. Well, I think most people are using GPS. I was actually just talking with an individual. He flies a Piper Cub, and he was making fun of me for flying with four flights. So, yes, I know, to each their own. Fly with it, fly without it. Uh, I prefer it, but I know some people like stick and rudder. So you fly as you see fit. I fly with GPS, and someone in the Middle East has figured out how to spoof GPSs, and it's playing havoc with aircraft navigation. Ops Group, a site used by airlines, business, and cargo pilots, is reporting that aircraft using Airway UMB 688 in northern Iraq are experiencing complete navigation system failures because the hacker replaces the position data beam by the GPS signals with false coordinates. Separate reports have now been received by Ops Group, and in most cases, the internal reference system becomes unusable. VOR DME sensor inputs fail, the aircraft UTC clock fails, and the crew has been forced to request vectors from ATC to navigate, the site reports. Ops Group says all of the aircraft involved have state-of-the-art navigation systems and include a range of Boeing, Gulfstream, Dassault, and Bombardier aircraft. The publication stressed that this is not ordinary GPS jamming, which is a common occurrence in the area. The attacks have been the same so far. The specific GPS receiver on a single aircraft is sent a signal that shifts the display position by 60 nautical miles. The aircraft's navigation system freaks out at the sudden change in data, and in almost all cases, the screens become useless. Crews have been able to call ATC for vectors to stay on course. Obviously, the loss of precise navigation data is dangerous anywhere, especially in this area because of military action 
and proximity to Iranian airspace. These missed navigation and GPS positions most likely prompt a military intercept due to the proximity to Iranian airspace. Obviously, something closely to watch. Hopefully, this does not become more mainstream, but as we become more dependent on technology, my friend and his Piper Cub is probably the only one that can be immune to that. Now, does he know where he's at without the GPS? That's a question mark. <laughs> no, he's he's a good flyer. But nonetheless, something that I think we need to watch out for as technology advances. Unfortunately, the people that I want to wreak havoc uh, also increases. And we always are one step ahead or one step behind of potential issues and with new technology. Okay, we're here to talk about Eastern Airlines Flight 401. So let's get a little bit into the mysteries of that flight. The flight designated Eastern Airlines Flight 401 commenced its journey from John F. Kennedy International Airport in Queens, New York, en route to the tropical expanse of Miami International Airport in Florida. On that fateful night of December 29, 1972, a Lockheed L-1011-1 TriStar, bearing the registration of November 31 Echo Alpha, embarked on a routine journey that would soon plunge into the depths of aviation history. The aircraft, the 10th TriStar delivered to Eastern Airlines, was under the command of Captain Bob Loft, a seasoned aviator with 32 years of experience at Eastern and an impressive 29,700 flight hours. Alongside him were First Officer Albert John, or Bert, Stockstill, and Flight Engineer Donald Lois, or Don, Repo, both experienced professionals with thousands of flight hours under their belts. The routine flight took a dark turn at 23.32 or 11.32 hours as the aircraft initiated its approach into the Miami International Airport. Just a side break here on Miami International Airport. If you've ever been there, uh, it's a city-run airport, and you can tell very much that it's a city-run airport. It is hard to navigate. Uh, every time I've flown into Miami International Airport, because the terminals are separated, uh, if you're constantly flipping back and forth on your arrival gate. Sometimes it means you have to go through TSA several times because all the terminals aren't connected. Now, Miami International Airport does have plans to fix this, uh, which are currently ongoing. On June 4th, 2019, Miami-Dade County Board of Commissioners adopted a new capital improvement program at the Miami International Airport. They'll fund up to $5 billion in airport-wide modernization projects over the next five years to 15 years paving the way for future growth in passenger traffic and cargo traffic at Miami International Airport. The airport's projected to reach 77 million travelers and more than 4 million tons of freight by the year 2040. It is neat to see the Art Deco of the terminal. If you ever watch Miami Vice, uh, it makes several cameo shots, of course, the airport in it. Uh, but like I said, MIA is the identifier. Um, and many times that's how I think the city looks at the Miami International Airport. They are MIA to it. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, the problem with airport structures in the United States is if you have a city run airport, sometimes they can be run very well. Other times they're treated as like the water plant uh, or providing a essential service. And so as the customer, you sometimes don't get the best experience. I think Miami, obviously, right, sunny destination, doesn't have to worry about travelers coming. They know that they're busy, so you kind of just morph into this uh, reality of, okay, we're Miami International Airport, people are going to want to be here regardless of it. But looks like they're turning some things around for the passengers, uh, which is a good thing. All right, let's get back to our flight here. With 163 passengers and 13 crew members on board, the flight was routine until 23.32 hours when the airplane began its approach into Miami International Airport. After lowering the gear, the first officer, Stockstill, noticed the landing gear light indicator, a green light identifying that the nose gear is properly locked in the down position, had not illuminated. This was later discovered to be due to a burnt out light bulb. The landing gear could have been manually lowered nonetheless. The pilot cycled the landing gear but still failed to get a green confirmation light. Captain Loft, who was working the radio during this leg of the flight, told the tower they would discontinue their approach to the airport and requested to enter a holding pattern. An approach controller cleared the flight to climb to 2,000 feet and then hold over the west towards the Everglades. Uh, so they're over the great expanse of the Everglades. Uh, very. If you've been to the Everglades, it's very dark. If you haven't had a chance, Alligator Alley, that goes between Miami to the west side of Florida. It's a great road to see alligators on. I actually knew somebody in Florida, this would have been back in the 1990s, that used to drive Alligator Alley and find Alligator Roadkill. 
I'm not necessarily saying that's a good idea, but um, <laughs> to each their own again. Maybe he's the same guy that flies the Piper Cub. But to set the scene, the L-1011 is over a vast expanse of darkness. It's 1130 at night. If you're over the Everglades, there's really not much light in that area. Uh, the cockpit crew removed the light assembly, and the second officer was dispatched to the avionics bay beneath the flight deck to check via the small porthole whether the landing gear was indeed down. Fifty seconds after reaching their assigned altitude, Captain Loff instructed First Officer Stockstill to put the L-1011 on autopilot. For the next 80 seconds, the airplane maintained level flight. Then it dropped 100 feet, and then again flew level for two more minutes after which it began a descent so gradual it could not be perceived by the crew. In the next 70 seconds, the airplane lost another 250 feet, but that was enough to trigger an alarm, a C-Corps chime, located under the engineer's workstation. The engineer repo had gone below, and no indication was heard of the pilot's voices recorded on the CVR that they heard the chime. In another 50 seconds, the plane was at half of its assigned altitude. So Captain Loft was known as a strong captain, and he was commanding everybody in the flight deck to a singular focus of this mechanical issue with the light. So unfortunately, where this chime had happened, they couldn't hear it. And from the view from the flight deck, right, it's nighttime, you're over the Everglades, there's no visual reference that you're descending. This is what was recorded in the cockpit voice recorder. First officer, stock still. We did something to the altitude. Captain Loft, what? Stock still. We're still at 2,000 feet, right? Loft, hey, what's happening here? Less than 10 seconds after that exchange, the jetliner crashed. The location of the crash was west-northwest of Miami by 18.7 miles from the end of runway 9 or left. The airplane was traveling at 227 miles per hour when it hit the ground. With the aircraft in mid-turn, the left wing tip hit the surface first and the left engine and the left landing gear, making three trails through the sawgrass, each five feet wide and more than 100 feet long. When the main part of the fuselage hit the ground, it continued to move through the grass and water, breaking up as it went. The TriStar's port outer wing structure struck the ground first, following the number one engine and the port main undercarriage. The disintegration of the aircraft followed scattered wreckage over an area of 1,600 feet long and 330 feet wide in a southwesterly direction. Only small fragments of metal marked the wingtip's first contact, followed 49 feet further by three massive 115 feet swaths cut through mud and sawgrass by the aircraft's extended undercarriage before two of the legs were sheared off. Then came scattered parts from the number one port engine, and fragments from the port wing itself and port tailpipe. About 490 feet from the wingtip's initial contact to the ground, a massive fuselage had begun to break up, scattering components from the underfloor galley and cargo compartments and the cabin interior. At 820 feet long, the wreckage trail, the outer section of the starboard wing, tore off, gouging a 59-foot-long crater in the soft ground as it did so. From this point on, the breakup of the fuselage became more extensive, scattering metal fragments, cabin fittings, and passenger seats widely. The three major sections of the fuselage, the most intact of which was the tail assembly, lay in the mud towards the end of the wreckage trail. The fact that the tail assembly, rear fuselage, and number two mountain engine, and remains of the empennage finally came to rest substantially further forward than the major sections, and probably as a result of the number two engine continuing to deliver thrust during the actual breakup of the aircraft. No complete cross-section of the passenger cabin remained, and both the port wing and the tailpipe were demolished in fragments. Encouragingly, not far from the roofless fuselage center section, with the interior portion of the starboard wing still attached, lay a large, undamaged, and fully inflated rubber dinghy, one of a number carried by the TriStar in the event of emergency landing in water. The breakup of the fuselage had freed it from its stowage and activated its inflation mechanism. So uh, that is quite the coincidence that you have a crash that breaks up the aircraft and it actually jettisons one of the flotation devices and actually opens the flotation device. Robert Bud Marcus, an airboat pilot, was out frog gigging with Ray Dickinson. Yes, frog gigging. 
I know I had no idea what this was, so I'm just going to lay it in here for everybody. Frog gigging is commonly done at night, but it can be done during the day as well. Traditionally, flashlights or spotlights are used to locate the frogs as their eyes reflect the light at night, in addition to help the location of the frogs. Shining the light in their eyes dazes the frogs and makes it less likely for the frog to see an approaching hunter or incoming gig itself. A four or five tinned gig is often preferred for frog gigging, as they are normally wider, giving the frog gigger and more room for error when thrusting the gig at the frog. So if you look at any of the pictures online, a frog gigging kind of looks to me like a pitchfork. Wanted to throw that in there because I had never heard of that reference. Maybe you have. I'm sure our friend who eats alligators on Alligator Alley that we know, uh, he's probably a frog gigger himself. Bud and Ray rushed to rescue survivors. Bud received burns to his face, arms, and legs, a result of spilled jet fuel from the crash TriStar, but continued shuffling people in and out of the crash site that night and the next day. For his efforts, he received a humanitarian award from the National Air Disasters Alliance Foundation and the Illumitech Airboat Hero Award from the American Airboat Search and Rescue Association. In all, 75 people survived the crash, 67 of the 163 passengers, and 8 of the flight attendants. Despite their own injuries, their surviving flight attendants were credited with helping other survivors and several quick-thinking actions, such as warning survivors of the danger of striking matches due to jet fuel and swamp water, and singing Christmas carols to keep up hope and draw rescue teams' attention. Of the cockpit crew, only flight engineer Repo survived the initial crash, along with technical officer Donadino who was down in the nose electronics bay with Repo at the moment of impact. Stockstill was killed on impact, while Captain Loft died in the wreckage of the flight deck before he could be transported to the hospital. Repo was evacuated to a hospital, but later died from his injuries. Don Adio, the lone survivor of the four flight deck occupants, recovered from his injuries. Frank Borman, a former NASA astronaut and Eastern's senior vice president of operations, was awakened at home by a telephone call explaining of the probable crash. He immediately drove to Eastern Miami's offices and decided to charter a helicopter to the crash site. As the swampy terrain made rescue difficult and Eastern Airlines had not heard any news of progress in the rescue efforts, there he was able to land in a swampy patch of grass and coordinate rescue efforts. He accompanied three survivors in the helicopter to a hospital, including a flight attendant and passenger who lost her baby in the crash. Most of the dead were passengers in the aircraft's midsection. The swamp absorbed much of the energy of the crash, lessening the impact of the aircraft. The mud of the Everglades may have blocked wounds sustained by survivors presenting them from bleeding to death. However, it complicated survivors' recuperation as organisms in the swamp caused infection with the potential gas gangrene. Eight passengers became infected. Doctors used hyperbaric chambers to treat the infections. All of the survivors were injured. 60 received serious injuries and 17 suffered minor injuries that did not require hospitalization. The most common injuries were fractures to ribs, spines, pelvises, and lower extremities. 14 survivors had various degrees of burns. The National Transportation Safety Investigation discovered that the autopilot had been inadvertently switched from altitude hold to control wheel steering, CWS, mode and pitch. In this mode, once the pilot releases pressure on the yoke, control column, or wheel, the autopilot maintains the pitch altitude of the aircraft until the yoke is again moved. Investigators believe the autopilot switched modes when the captain accidentally leaned against the yoke while turning to speak to the flight engineer, who was sitting behind and to the right of him. The slight forward pressure of the stick would have caused the aircraft to enter a low descent maintained by the CWS system. Investigation into the aircraft's autopilot showed that the force required to switch to the CWS mode was different between A and B channels. Thus, the switching of the CWS to channel A did not occur in channel B, thus depriving the first officer of any indication that the mode had changed. Channel A provides the captain instruments with data, while channel B provides the first officers. So what they're saying there is when the captain loft pushed his yoke forward, it would have only been discernible through his side of the flight deck versus the first officers. After the aircraft had descended 250 feet from the selected altitude of 2,000 feet, a C chord sounded from the rear speaker this altitude alert, designed to warn pilots of an inadvertent deviation from selected altitude, went unnoticed by the crew. Investigators believe this was due to the crew being distracted by nose gear light and because the flight engineer was not in his seat when it sounded, so he would not have been able to hear it. 
Visually, since it was nighttime, the aircraft was flying over a darkened terrain of the Everglades. No ground lights or other visual signs indicated the TriStar was slowly descending. Captain Loft was found during the autopsy to have an undetected brain tumor in an area that controlled his vision. However, the NTSB concluded that the captain's tumor did not contribute to the accident. The final NTSB report cited the cause of the crash was pilot error, specifically the failure of the flight crew to monitor flight instruments during the final four minutes of flight, and to detect the unexpected descent soon enough to prevent impact within the ground. Preoccupation with the malfunction of the nose landing gear position indicating system distracted the crew's attention from instruments and allowed the descent to go unnoticed. In response to other accidents during the 1970s, many airlines started crew resource management training for their pilots. This training is designed to make problem solving in the cockpit much more efficient, thus causing less distraction for flight crews. Flashlights are also now standard equipment near jump seats, and all jump seats are outfitted with shoulder harnesses. So this crash was instrumental in the development of crew resource management, really taking you know, the the individuals that are on a flight deck and assigning responsibility and duties. You see a lot of accidents that happen in culture where seniority dominating direction. And so there is still a lot of accident reports that we've seen over the years from countries where the captain to the first officer relationship, right? The captain has more seniority. The first officer feels like they can't uh, necessarily say to the captain that they think that they're doing something incorrect. We saw this with Avianca Flight 052, where the first officer uh, was saying that the fuel was a priority, but the captain was senior to, obviously, the first officer. And so there was that relationship that did not allow to utilize crew resource management for that flight. Uh, there's still very much a hierarchy of the captain is the captain. The captain is going to do what they say. So this crash was instrumental in the development of crew resource management and really led to a much better safety culture for aviation as a whole. As we talked about at the beginning of this, as we're getting into our Halloween season, one of the interesting components of this story is, as we talked about, this aircraft was fairly new. And because of the way it crashed, there were a lot of undamaged components in this aircraft. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the reported ghost sightings. During the following months and years, stories began circulating that employees of Eastern Airlines and numerous passengers have reported sightings of dead crew members. Captain Robert Loft and second officer flight engineer Donald Repo sitting aboard the L-1011s, including a particular November 318 Echo Alpha. These stories speculated that parts of the crashed aircraft were salvaged after the investigation and refitted to other L-1011s. The reported hauntings were said to be seen only on the planes that used the spare parts. Gossip regarding the sightings of spirits of Don Repo and Bob Loft spread through Eastern Airlines, to the extent that Eastern Airlines management warned employees that they could be dismissed if caught spreading ghost stories. While Eastern Airlines publicly denied their planes were haunted, they reportedly removed all the salvaged parts from the L-1011 fleet. Over time, the reporting of ghost sightings stopped. An original floorboard from Flight 401 remains in the archives at History Miami in South Florida. Pieces of Flight's 401 wreckage can also be found in Ed and Lorraine Warren's Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut. The story of the crash and the aftermath were documented in John Fuller's 1970 book, The Ghost Flight of 401. Fuller recounts stories of paranormal events aboard other Eastern Airline aircraft and believed that these were caused by equipment salvaged from the wreckage of Flight 401. There was a televised movie also titled The Ghost of Flight 401 that broadcasted on NBC in 1978. This was based on Fuller's book. It emphasized the ghost sightings. Even in 1979, musician Bob Welch recorded a song titled The Ghost of Flight 401. I've never heard of that, so I don't think it got to the popularity of, like, say, the Gordon Lightfoot's Edmunds Fitzgerald song. I suggest you go look it up. I'm going to go look it up uh, when I'm done with this podcast. Eastern Airlines flight CEO and former Apollo astronaut Frank Borman termed the ghost stories about the crash as garbage. Eastern considered suing for libel based on the assertions of the cover-up by Eastern executives, but Borman opted not to, feeling the lawsuit would merely provide more publicity to the book. Loft's widow and children did sue Fuller for infringement on Loft's right to publicity, for invasion of privacy, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. But the lawsuit was dismissed and the dismissal upheld by the Florida 4th District Court of Appeal. According to Robert Serling's 1980 book, From the Captain to the Colonel, 
an informal history of Eastern Airlines. The claim that the wreckage from Flight 401 was installed and later removed from other Eastern aircraft was false, and no Eastern employees had ever claimed they had seen or believed in alleged ghost sightings. Skeptic Brian Dunning claims that the origin of the ghost sightings was a joke made up by Eastern Airlines captain after an emergency landing in which he quipped he thought Don Repo's ghost was on the plane. So I thought just real quick we'd talk about the L-1011 because it's such a distinctive aircraft. I've had the pleasure of seeing them before. I actually had the pleasure of flying on one. Um, Unfortunately, probably never going to get that chance again. In the late 1960s, American Airlines approached Lockheed and Douglas and asked the aircraft makers, if they could build a medium to long range wide body tri-jet airliner, a stipulation that it would be big enough to carry as many as 250 passengers on a transcontinental route. Having experienced some difficulties with its military aircraft program, Lockheed was eager to re-enter the civilian airline market. In answer to American Airlines request, Douglas came up with a DC-10 and Lockheed L-1011. Because Lockheed built the TriStar using the latest technology available, the price of the plane was more expensive than the DC-10. The design of the TriStar featured a two-aisle interior large enough to accommodate as many as 400 passengers in a single-class configuration. Despite showing considerable interest in the L-1011, in the end, American Airlines went to the DC-10. With American Airlines not buying the TriStar, deliveries went to Transworld Airlines and Eastern Airlines. The TriStar received its FAA certification on April 14, 1972, and entered service with Eastern Airlines on April 26, 1972. To break even on the project, Lockheed needed to sell 500 L-1011s. That's quite a lot of aircraft. Due to many delays, the L-1011 lost out to the Douglas DC-10. In the end, during its production run between 1968 and 1984, Lockheed built 250 L-1011 TriStars, The failure to break even on the project forced the Maryland headquarter company to withdraw from the civilian aircraft marketplace and concentrate on production of military aircraft and defensive systems. The last L-1011 is modified and is used for launching rockets into space. This L-1011 is known as Stargazer. It was built in 1974 and delivered to Air Canada that same year. In 1994, a Dulles, Virginia-based Orbital Science Corporation purchased the plane with the intention of using it to help launch satellites into space. The plane was sent to Marshall Air Space in Cambridge, England, where it was modified to carry the Pegasus rocket. TriStar Stargazer first launched a Pegasus rocket in 1994. Pegasus satellite launches usually took place from Vandenberg Air Force Base in Santa Barbara, California. In 2010, Northrop Grumman acquired Orbital Sciences, and they retrofitted the aircraft with Rolls-Royce turbofan engines. So unfortunately, we only have one L-1011 flying in the skies. So as I said, we probably will never get our chance to be on the aircraft again. Not probably, definitely. (laughs) Um... But that is the end of our spooky tale today. So spooky tale of government shutdown, spooky tale of Eastern Flight 401. As I said, as we go into this month of October, my intention is to have each week another kind of story that's wrapped in some sort of a Halloween-esque theme. And let's hope when we meet back up next week, we can talk about the government shutdown that didn't happen. Unfortunately, we may be talking about where we are at in that government shutdown. But I want to thank each and every one of you for taking some time with me today. Like I said, I will be at the National Business Aviation Association Conference October 17th through the 19th. If you find yourself there, let me know. Um, If you want to buy a sticker, they are on the website. Uh, You can always hit me up through that. Follow me on Instagram or send over an email at dapodcast85 at gmail.com. So as we descend from the eerie heights of Eastern Flight 401, let this tale be a harbinger for the spectral secrets that may lurk in the vast expanse above. Whether you're a seasoned aviator or an armchair enthusiast, remember that the skies carry more than the weight of metal and wings. So next time you find yourself flying, gazing out at the endless horizon, consider the possibility that the veil between the earthly and the an ethereal may be as thin as the clouds drifting by. In the realm where flight paths intersect with the supernatural, who knows what tales linger in the turbulence waiting to be told. Until our next ascent into the unknown, keep your eyes on the skies and your imagination soaring. Safe travels, and may your journeys be free from both earthly turbulence and otherworldly whispers. Until next time, my friends, I will see you down the runway.